Hi, welcome for today's talk on how to ace the product design interview. My name is Tim. I'm a product manager at Meta, and I've kept this talk and this explanation very general. So it will help you when you're preparing for your product design interviews on how you understand a question, how you approach it, and how you can prepare yourself at the the best. It helped me a lot, and it took me a while until I got, got there. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to share this with you. What I'll be doing in this interview or in this conversation is actually um, I'll be shutting off the camera and we'll put the presentation into the front. So you'll just hear my voice and I hope that this is uh, more useful for you. Now, let me now just uh, share my screen. Okay, so you should be seeing now my, my screen. Okay, look. Now, in general, interviewing is a muscle. When I started myself, I wasn't very confident in doing any kind of, kind of interviews. And it took me a while actually until I got there. And it depends on where you are in your career path and how often you have done these. Sometimes doing like a bit of a refresher will get you to the point where you need to be. If you haven't really done a lot of these uh, until now, you might need a while until you get there. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's 30, maybe it's 50, maybe it's 60. There are platforms out there that can help you to do this. Um, I know that product school itself is uh, offering like um, capabilities or like uh, opportunities to do these kind of interviews. There are other platforms out there that you can look for and um, uh, find that it can help you actually to find other people you're going to mock with and train yourself until you get to the point where you feel confident. What is super important uh, in my opinion is that you don't follow anything blindly. And what I mean, what I mean by this, any kind of framework that you will be seeing somewhere has reasons why it has all those pieces together. But if you don't get to the point that you understand why something is being done, then it's not going to be a tool for you. Um, and what I mean by this is like, it's hard if you just like follow blindly something, the interviewer will notice this. But if you're doing something very intentionally and you know why you're doing what you're doing, that will help you actually to have a much better conversation and a much better inter experience for your interviewer. So you don't sound like a robot. Uh, let's put it like this. And if you know why you're doing what you're doing, it will help you if the conversation gets different or is being changed by the interviewer through questions, um, you are able to adapt to these and you're not taken outside of your plan. Okay, so now you can think about this. This is kind of like an analysis how I see myself the interview. And uh, I'm going to walk you through all those different steps uh, separately. But what I want to make sure is that you see that there are those different steps. And uh, on one side, you have the interviewer. And on the other side, you have to interview. And I'll walk you through each of those steps. Now, we have, for example, the small talk, building a bridge. And you have the question that comes from your interviewer. And now it is on you after you got the question to give back that type of feedback, to disambiguate the question, restate an objective, dive deeper into the topics, understand the stakeholders, shape the persona and see what are the needs of those personas, create a mission statement. Yes, very late in the process, then craft the solutions and then look on how you can actually measure the success of those or assess the risks. Now let's dive into each of those. The small talk, build a bridge. Normally, that's not been seen as a kind of a step in your in the normal frameworks that you might be seeing, but I think it's something worth noting and, and talking about. The goal of a small talk is a way to build the first bridge with the interviewer. I be aware of that. Um, if you introduce yourself, you shouldn't go into like a five-minute talk because it's going to eat much of your very needed time for the interview but know how to introduce yourself nicely and have a smile on your face, be friendly, 
It depends. Sometimes the interviewer might not be in the best mood. They might have had the stress day. They might have be like be the person where you feel like that they get the feeling. Okay, this is today is going to be a fun conversation, and it's not going to be necessarily something where they are going to be drained more. So put this into your mind, uh, and if you go into a conversation like that. And if you get this positivity into the conversation, it should help you and it will help the interviewer because at the end of the day, it is a dance that you'll be doing. Now, let's say we are going to this interview, to introduce yourself, and then the question comes, design sunglasses for toddlers. I want you to think about something that this question is now the question that I'm um, sharing as an example, but the interview might have had asked this question already 20 times and it's just assessing you. That That's what, what I, something I was doing while I was working with different interview partners. I had one question which I knew in and out and I would just use it in order to have people, uh, uh, in order for me to be able to assess and compare people much better. So seeing those different answers to the same questions are going to give the interviewer much better ability to compare. So have this just in your mind um, that this question might have been answered for the person already 20 times. Uh, that doesn't change anything for you from your perspective, but I think it's worth looking about uh, looking at it from that from from your perspective and being aware that here it's not necessarily about like you are going with your answer. It's not your answer. It's the way how you get there, the conversation, how you lead it, the, the thinking, how you lay it out. That is what's going to shine. And it's going to show that you are a great communicator and a great product manager. So if you get this type of question, design sunglasses for toddlers, the first most important thing that you need to do is to disambiguate the question and uh, retrieve more information from the from the interviewer. And why are you doing this? You're doing this because you want to make sure that both of you are on the same page. Um, the question that I've given you might sound very straightforward. Design sunglasses for toddlers. Could be actually easy, right? Now, it depends. You don't know what's going on in the mind of the interviewer. Give, I'll give you an example. If I were to tell you, go and buy bread. For you right now, if you would take that as, an, as, an, as a task, it would be very simple for you. You know where to go to and buy the bread, how you have to pay for it, etc., etc. For your world. If I were to take you and transform you into another country, let's say India, and tell you, go and buy bread. If you're not an Indian, or in a surrounding that's just not familiar to you, you will have a hard time. You will start to ask, ask questions. Okay, where do I go, go and buy bread? How do I pay for this? What do you mean by bread? Is there different types of bread? Um, like you, you see that once you are in this ambiguous situation, something that is not clear to you, you start to ask questions. And that is the most important skill of a product manager to ask questions, ask them directly and try to understand the other side. And this is here your opportunity to ask these type of questions. See the interview as the first data point who can give you information about that question. And you want to make sure that you break out of your own thinking patterns and look at the problem broadly. Imagine you don't know anything about sunglasses. Imagine you don't know anything about toddlers. Ask, what type of sunglasses? Anything specific? Why are we doing this? Um, Am I am I a startup? Who am I? What like all these type of questions will help you to form a better understanding of how the interviewer is thinking about this. They might not give you a lot of tasks, uh, uh, clues. That's possible. That's okay. But they, at least you have 
you have asked that that question and then if 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 they don't give you clues it's okay to get some assumptions in and state them but at the end of the day you should make sure that you have taken that opportunity to ask as many questions as possible about this question so uh yeah I, sometimes i say you are the humble john snow it means you know nothing and this is how you should approach it and with questions you will learn more so once you have asked these questions you should be restating the objective um meaning you will get the confirmation at the end from the interviewer that you're on the same page uh and and the, the objective itself will sound very very similar to what the interviewer had asked you design for example here in this case could be design sunglasses for toddlers in the usa as a startup founder okay don't make this part too lengthy but what you're doing um if you go here back to the to the front you get the question which is being played from the interviewer you disambiguate in ambiguity the question by asking questions like it will actually it should have had a had a an error on this side as well because it goes in both directions right you get disambiguate and you get answers and so on and then you it's your turn now you have all the information from the from the interviewer and now it's your turn you restate the objective and just to make sure you're going to reformulate this question again with your own words okay so now you've done that you restate the objective you know what you have to do now let's go and dig into it now you this is something i like to do um i want to dive deep into the topic um and it tells me or it, it gives me the opportunity for two things one it gives me the opportunity to brainstorm and it gives me also the opportunity to show how i think deeply about things for example here in this case sunglasses did we have sunglasses 100 years ago yes no why didn't we have them back then did we have them for toddlers when did we start to have them for toddlers why do they exist when did you when did i start wearing sunglasses myself have i bought sunglasses for other toddlers how do i think about toddlers like i i want to make sure like of course you can take this to length and talk like for too long and especially this can be a problem for talkative people but what it helps you it lays out that space that you're talking about it lays out that problem space broadly and it's it's more like a brainstorm session and you can also introduce them so i'm going to talk a bit about this topic i just want to get a feel for it and what it is right and you then you dive into it and you try to to get those um, treasures um from that topic and lay them out and it it can help you but again be aware that you don't want to make this too long and the next step is to examine the stakeholders um and i mean i don't normally dive just in directly into the user you know the consumer I want to like out okay there are producers uh there is a distribution and then there is the consumer now why do I do this what it helps me again is more like these two are definitely not something that you should dive into deep let's say you have something about mm, sorry like the producers like just be aware and you sh you show your the the ability to to understand the economic environment where the product would be living in right uh keep that part at least for those here short but make sure that you then go into the consumer and you focus and what type of consumers could there be um here in that case parents toddlers and and the family maybe who they could be buyers right or they are going to influence the buying decision then the next part is what you're going to do is to shape the persona and identify needs something that really helped me is to think about it as vectors and what i mean by that is uh in the beginning sometimes i would use actually at, at one point in time i would use um i would see it like as a, a group inside of a group inside of a group right 
um, parent, but what it helped me to look at it differently and look at it as if it's vectors, because there are parents who have more attention to fashion or less attention to fashion, are more price sensitive than others. Uh, younger parents or older parents, um, actually this part here vision should have been here with the, with the toddler because it's kind of like the, do they have a problem with the vision, yes or no? Um, but also you want to protect your child. How much do you want to protect it? What kind of features should this, uh, this thing give you? Or the, those sunglasses for, for toddlers, they could be gender, probably not relevant here, but I mean, I'm just giving you a type of examples and think about this. You can say at the end, okay, I'm going to focus on a, uh, you might even not need necessarily to focus, right? To pick a certain group or pick a certain characteristic, uh, but it would help you uh, because you're here shaping the persona and you're identifying the needs. So for example, you could say at the end, you say, I'm going to design sunglasses for, um, no, I want to I wanna look at toddlers uh, and make sure that this is playful and it's very robust right? Uh, what they're doing. Um, I like the, the, the sunglasses itself. And uh, I think that fashion is actually very important for, for the parents and for this whole thing. So it shows you how you're actually shaping and uh, the, the, the product itself uh, and, and what are the need, like you're looking at the persona, you're looking at the, the customer, you're looking at what are the specific needs that they have. And that will then uh, help you to understand or to show and convey that um, that you've understood who you should be designing for in a, in a situation like that. Now, let's, after I've done that, I do create the mission statement. Um, from, from, sometimes I would hear people to create the mission statement at a very early stage, some, somewhere here, right? After they disambiguate the question, they create the mission statement. But I don't believe that this is actually the right spot to do. Because until at this point, you have not yet really created the mission. You don't even know who you're going to talk to, who you're going to design for, who you're going to uh, create the solutions for. Um, it's a diff there is a difference between the objective and the mission statement. Uh, let me show you. So for example, here, this objective, we have it, design sunglasses for toddlers in the USA as a startup founder. Now, the mission is put fun into toddler sunglasses. That is kind of what I got out of this here, right? I know I'm going to do it for toddlers. I know that it should be playful. Um, and that is the most important part that I'm seeing. While I'm aware that this is going to be bought by parents, but it's different because what I'm giving here, the mission statement, gives my objective purpose. Now I have now I'm an arrow, and now I want it, I know exactly where I want to shoot. Okay. And here I start with crafting the solutions. Come up with creative solutions. Uh, it could be one solution that had different sections, or it could be three different solutions. Make sure that you're not stuck with like one very simple thing. That's the point. Um, you don't have, sometimes people say, come up with five solutions, four solutions. The point is not about the number itself. The point about being able to show the creativity. When I did this once as a mock interview myself, um, the idea I had was actually those click clack sunglasses. So meaning sunglasses that had three different parts that can be taken, taken uh, uh, apart, uh, easily taken apart. So the glasses on the front and then the one on the left, one on the right, you can take them apart. And then you can buy different parts with different colors. They can have maybe different branded themes like the Elsa edition. And then you can change them. You can interchange them with your friends and you can have an app and the app can be, um, you can configure them in, in an app uh, and then you can buy them and then you can share the combination. So you see that one solution by itself can actually be sufficient. If you show a different type of creativity in that solution. If you're very confident about the solution, that should be fine to select just one solution. Another solution could be, but I mean, if you have more than one solution, definitely not a bad thing. 
But I know that interview situations not necessarily always give you those spark and those creative ideas. So um, as long as you have one delighting, delightful solution, that should be fine. Um, but for example, here, sunglasses that are so flexible and bendable made out of rubber in different colors could be also a solution, right? There is something where people very often, I think I should have put this here into the slide, avoid buzzwords. AI, machine learning um, is probably the most important part. And then what else? Yeah, um, like AR, VR. What interviewers try to do, or people who, who, who came up with these things, they try to like impress with buzzwords. That's what they're doing. If these things are not purposeful, I feel like you are kind of not showing that you can be focused in the in the real world. Like for example, uh, once I had someone who would give me like an order to pick chew, uh, pick cheese in a grocery store, they would have. AR glasses that that can then indicate what what kind of cheese they should pick. Sounds like an amazing solution, but like it's so far off, and all the technical complications that come with it to create something like this is like pretty big. Being pragmatic, in my opinion, shows the like pragmatism that you have, uh, that you can have, and that you can bring in in order to do like uh, yeah to do good product management and yeah. Being pragmatic is not, not a bad thing. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't use those buzzwords, uh, meaning, but they need to be purposeful. They need to be clear that they're really adding value to the solution and that they are achievable. Um, they are not too far off. Yeah, that's my personal opinion. The sky is always the limit, but again, uh, make sure that you don't burn yourself when you're flying towards the sun. Okay, so now you've crafted those solutions. Okay, now the most important part or the last part is to measure the success. Um, because you want to, like, why do you measure the success? Because you want to sh show that you are able to identify how to track the success of a product. How will you collect the feedback? Will it be qualitative or quantitative? Are you aware of metrics? Do you take the human feedback into account? For example, here in this cumber, uh, in this case could be the number of sunglasses sold or the sunglasses created in the app or the feedback you get from buyers. Um, that could be something. And then you could also look at the risks or should be looking at the risks, uh, for example, and that shows that you are able to look forward and identify the problems that can come up, right? Look, for example, pieces fall off too easily if it's not made very, um, uh, if the solution of those sunglasses, they, 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 the pieces fall off too easily from each other, okay? That, that's not like you need to make sure that this is bulletproof because it's for toddlers, right? Choking danger. Uh, you're creating smaller pieces that might result in a problem. You need to make sure that this doesn't like, there is always like more risks that you can actually list, but what it shows here is that you are able to think ahead and see these type of problems. Um, yeah. So that's about it. And that uh, itself uh, can be, yeah, uh, an interesting experience to go through through an interview like that. What what I'm going to make sure is that um, you need to look at this here. That this year, this is a dance. It's a conversation. This is a conversation, and the conversation is a dance. And you can only become better at dancing when you train. And understanding this here, like in theory, is good. But understanding why each of those building blocks exists, uh, why are they there, and this might be from this framework, might be from other frameworks, make sure that you understand really deeply why you're doing what you are doing. Once you do that, then you are able to use any kind of framework as a tool set that can help you to shape the conversation or the interview and uh, make sure that you make a good impression. Thank you very much. I hope that 
Um, let me stop the share and yeah, thank you very much for listening. I hope that I was able to convey a good message for you guys and that it's uh, useful and helpful for you. I wish you all the best. Uh, good luck for your interviews. And I'm sure that you guys will ace it and you'll get exactly where you need to be. Have a good day. Bye.